Welcome to my talk uh, about fearless multimedia. For the title of the talk, I'm pretty nervous, so not so fearless. <laughs> um, who am I? Um, my name is uh, Zishan Ali, um, and I work for a company called Collabra. Uh, legally, I'm a freelancer, so, um, but I have only one client only, so it's kind of I'm working for them. Um, and uh, both my company uh, and me, both my companies, the one man company and <laughs> Collabora and me, uh, we all work on FOSS. Um, I have always been involved in FOSS and um, mainly uh, GNOME development has been my thing. Um, I have worked on other things as well, uh, mostly related to GNOME, but not always. Um, and uh, my hobbies include uh, cats and flying, <laughs> not the toys, the that people fly nowadays, but the real things. <laughs> um, and what am I going to talk about is um, GStreamer and, and Rust, um, both of them combined. And I have to cover both of both these topics, and they're pretty uh, hard to you know understand like everything about it, uh, all the essential things. So I'll try to be very fast. But if I'm not explaining something well, please just interrupt and tell me, and I can try to explain better <laughs> um, before I move forward. Um, so it's been inspired by another talk by uh, Sebastian uh, Drogue. Um, he's doing most of the GStreamer in Rust, and he has been a long-time GStreamer hacker. Um, and he's like really competent in both these technologies, so he does most of this work. Um, you can think of me as a replacement of him in, in this talk. Um, and it's inspired by his, his talks that he has been giving on this topic. Um, first of all, uh, let's talk about Rust. Um, before I move forward, how many of you know both Rust and GStreamer? Like just basics. Yeah, know of like what it is. <laughs> okay, not many. Um, the, let's start with Rust. How many people know basics of Rust? Quite a lot, so I won't explain a lot. I'll just go very fast. So Rust is a systems programming language. Um, and it's one of the first in its kind that it um, focuses on both safety and efficiency at the same time. There has been a lot of programming languages, as you all know. Um, many of them focus on safety, um, and they are pretty safe, and some are safer than the others, but um, most of them haven't been very efficient um, and at system use uh, utilization. And um, uh, then the Programming languages are very efficient. They are not, never safe, like C and C++ mainly. Uh, they are extremely unsafe languages. Uh, Rust is the first one to combine them all. Maybe there are other languages. I don't know of them, but Rust is one of them. Um, one of the main things about Rust is that it, it has a concept of zero-cost abstraction. Um, that is to say that um, it provides high-level uh, APIs um, to, uh, and concepts to um, to easily achieve many things, many, uh, for example, hash tables and lists and all the data types you're used to, it will provide those APIs for you. Um, but uh, the concept is that uh, uh, even though they're high level um, and it's easy, they don't have any runtime costs because of that, um, which is associated with the same uh, libraries, uh, APIs in other uh, programming languages. Um, and um, with regards to safety, the one of the first thing about it is that it has no null pointers, uh, no uh, dangling pointers allowed. Um, actually, you can't really call the pointers in Rust as pointers, um, but I'll talk about it a bit later as well. Um, so, so a lot of problems that arise from pointer handling in other languages like C and C++, they don't, most of them, don't, they don't exist in, in Rust. Um, but um, sometimes you need to interact with unsafe code, like for example, when you're interacting with some C code um, or C++ code, um, you have to do a foreign function interface and that is by its nature unsafe because you cannot uh, make the C code that is written safe um, because it's not written in Rust. Um, so for that, uh, Rust allows you to uh, have an unsafe um, uh, syntax. Like it has a keyword and you um, have all the, uh, like whichever code you, you want to write, uh, which is not safe, you put it in that, um, in those, uh, in the, in the brackets, in the, in the context. So um, you have all the um, unsafe code very isolated. So when you have a problem in your um, 
in your Rust code, you would know the, which, which code to be suspicious of, first of all, and most likely that will be the code that is causing the problems if you have especially some memory, uh, memory issues. Um, so it, it isolates it, and that's already uh, a big achievement. Um, and um, also it has other concepts like non-mutable state by default. Um, so by default, all your state is uh, non-mutable. But if you want mutation, then you, you mark it as mutable um, uh, parameter or, or a variable. And uh, then when you have the same applies to that, uh, when you have a problem, usually it's with mutable states. So you should be first suspicious of all the uh, variables and uh, arguments that are marked mutable, um, and then move on from there. So it makes it a bit easier to debug the code if you, if you have ever problems. Um, and um, it has a very strict ownership semantics. Um, it's not a concept in C and C++. Well, um, in C, it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as ownership. Uh, if you have a pointer to something, you can do whatever you want with it. Um, if you, um, in C++, C++ um, you have some APIs in modern C++, especially the um, smart pointers. Uh, but that's something you can use. It's not like you have to use it. Um, you can still do the same thing as in C, that you don't really have an owner, and you can just mess things up uh, in, a, in a big way. Um, and um, in other high-level languages, this problem is solved by, uh, for you uh, by the garbage collector. Um, so you don't have to deal with memory. Uh, there's a garbage collector that deals with uh, it for you. Like if, um, if all the um, code that is pointing, uh, that needs a particular resource, it goes out of scope, um, you, um, uh, it, a garbage collector frees it at some point for you. But it comes at, uh, at a runtime cost. Um, so if, if you don't want to pay that cost, you, do, you don't want to use those languages then. Um, but in Rust, it's, it's uh, uh, solved by the ownership concept. Um, and the concept is that you have only and only one owner at a time of, uh, of a resource. Um, that means that you cannot, not just from two threads, but from any two points in the code, you cannot have um, ownership at the same time of the same resource. And Sorry. And this, for example, uh, in this sample, um, if you uh, assign something to S1, a resource, and then later on you assign the same thing to S2, you have moved the ownership now to S2. So if you try to build, uh, build this code, it won't work. Rust will complain that you have already moved S1 resource to S2, and now S1 doesn't exist anymore because you have moved the resource, because you can't have two owners at the same time. Um, but you can't work like that. If you have just this restriction, you, you, you won't be able to achieve much in, in Rust. So there are then exceptions that are safer, um, and then you use those exceptions. And one of the first one is borrowing. It's used a lot for uh, function arguments in, in the APIs. All the APIs, you will always see uh, things being uh, borrowed. And um, it's similar to reference, uh, passing by reference in C++. Um, and what you do is you um, give uh, the ownership, you borrow the ownership uh, to another variable or an argument to a function temporarily, and then they can use it, and then the, uh, they return it. And for, for example, if you pass it to a function, um, you, uh, when it returns, you have the ownership back. It, it's not borrowed anymore. Um, so for example, in this uh, sample, which is a, uh, a modification of the previous one, um, you, instead of moving the S1, you are giving a reference. You're borrowing a reference to S1 and S2. And now you can use them both at the same time. And uh, since you borrowed it read-only, um, you can have multiple reference, multiple uh, uh, borrows of the same resource, because it doesn't matter how many borrows you have at the same time. It's, it's all read-only. Um, but the problem with borrows is it's temporary. So a lot of times you want to have a, like you want to keep the reference. Like for example, you pass um, uh, a resource to a, uh, to a function um, that wants to put it in a structure and that it wants to keep the structure around. Um, then um, you can't use borrows, and uh, for that reason you have um, uh, so the other uh, data types in Rust that makes it possible. Like for example, RCT, it's reference counted, so it adds reference counting to the resource. Um, so you actually don't keep the actual resource. You don't keep a pointer to that. For example, in here, S1 is um, the uh, pointer to RC type. So, um, and that, key, that is keeping the actual resource in it. Um, and each time you want to have multiple um, 
uh, accesses to the same um, object or, or to the same resource, you just clone the the RC. And um, when all these um, uh, RC instances go out of scope, uh, the actual resource will also be freed automatically for you. So you don't have to care about that. It's a Rust. Um, I didn't mention that it operates on scopes. Um, so um, when things go out of scope, uh, Rust freeze uh, compiler frees those things for you. Uh, and it's decided at build time, so it's not there's no garbage collection involved at runtime. Um, and then, um, but the RC that I mentioned just now, it's um, it's only from single thread, so you can't use it from multiple threads, because um, um, uh, yeah, to Rust wants to make sure that you um, have it um, so that it's it's not like uh, um, uh, because it's not atomic. So you can't um, atomically increase the reference count or decrease the reference count, so it would be a bit uh, unsafe to use it from um, multiple threads. Um, so for that, we, we have a concept in Rust called fearless concurrency, because um, if you do concurrent programming in Rust, you are, you're safe. You don't, have to be, um, uh, you don't have to be scared of it. In other programming languages, people are really scared of threads, and they should be. But in Rust, you don't have to be. Um, because it has um, uh, API and concepts that uh, helps you make it safe. And uh, ARC is one of this, those types that it provides for multi-threading. Um, and it's just uh, RC, but it's, um, um, uh, it's atomic uh, uh, reference counting, so you can use it from multiple threads at the same time. Um, although it's, um, it only gives you read-only access, so you can't modify for multiple um, threads. Um, uh, you can't get um, mod modifiable, immutable state from it. Um, and for that reason, there is another data type called mutex um, that allows you to uh, get uh, mutable um, access to the, to the actual resource. Um, I would normally explain with, with samples here, but I have to cover a lot of things, so I won't get into details. But if you have some questions afterwards, please let me know, and I can explain each of these things in detail to you in person. Um, that gets, it to, uh, gets, gets us to GStreamer. Um, what is GStreamer? Um, it's a multimedia framework. So if you want to write anything related to multimedia, especially audio and video, uh, this is the framework you would want to use. It's the multimedia framework of choice for all the Linux, Linux platforms. Um, and um, it's, um, it has some simple concepts like um, elements and pipelines. So each, um, you, you create a pipeline for each multimedia application. And in that pipeline, you put elements together, depending on your needs. Um, there is a concept of source and sync and filter. Um, and you would connect those elements. It's a bit like Legos. Um, so um, you, you have different elements, and you just put them together, and you achieve a goal. I have an example here so that it's easier to understand what I'm saying. Um, for example, if you want to write um, player for OG um, uh, files, video files, which has audio and video both um, multiplexed into it. Um, does anyone, everyone know what OG is and Vorbis is? <laughs> Good. Um, so um, uh, it's simple. You, you put a file source because you want to first file, read from a file. Um, you connect it to um, a demuxer, which uh, demultiplexes uh, the audio and video parts. And then you connect both those parts uh, to elements that decode both those formats. And once they are decoded, they need to be played. Um, and for playing, uh, you have syncs, different kinds of syncs. So I can't barely see it here. So video sync in here, it's uh, kept generic because we have multiple video syncs, Wayland and, and X and all those. And also, the audio syncs are, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so um, uh, there's no specific example here. Um, but anyway, uh, the concept is that you, in each element, you have uh, something called pads. The blue things you see in here, they are called pads. And you don't actually connect elements directly, but you connect them through these pads. And each pad is of type either source or sync. And that means that you can only connect source to a sync. You can't just connect source and source and sync and sync, because that doesn't make sense. Um, and in, uh, all the, the, the real uh, multimedia content, they flow on only in one direction. Um, there can be events and other things that flow upstream, but uh, all other th uh, the main multimedia content, it always uh, flows downstream. Um, and uh, through the source and sinks. 
Uh, one thing, one example that I would show later, it will require um, uh, this information about something called capabilities. Uh, it's called GStreamer caps in GStreamer world. Um, and that those caps are on each pad. So um, when you connect two pads, how do you know they're compatible? Um, the, the way to do that is, is through, through caps. Each pad, um, when, you, when you create your element, you, you declare what kind of um, capabilities it, uh, the pad has. Um, for example, uh, in this case, the uh, Vorbis decoders uh, sync pad will uh, declare that I, on this SRC pad, I, I can only take uh, Vorbis uh, data and no other data, no other kind of data I can take. Um, so if you try to connect the, uh, the SRC02 pad to the sync of uh, decoder up there, uh, it won't work because um, they are not compatible. Um, and that's, that's the way to, to check the compatibility. Um, it's a plugin-based architecture. Um, which makes it very um, uh, easy to write apps, generic apps. Um, so you, you're in your application, you usually don't have to care which data formats to handle. And you can do that if you really want to and you really need to, but usually, uh, like for example, a media player uh, application like Totem or GNOME Video, however you call it, um, they don't usually need to do that. They don't uh, deal with individual different kinds of data. Um, and that's, that makes it very powerful. Uh, and it also makes the, the core of GStreamer very, very small. So it's, it's really tiny. Um, and the plugins do the actual work. Um, it's written in C um, for efficiency reasons and for many other reasons. Uh, a lot of AP, um, libraries that are in, used in GNOME, they are in C. Uh, so there is a cultural aspect to that too. Um, and it's um, heavily multi-threaded. It, it makes use of multi-threading, so to make use of your multi-core. Um, so if in the previous example, for example, there will be a separate CPU used for uh, decoding the, the Vorbis audio and the Theora uh, video parts. Um, it's not very relevant to apps. Um, so if you're an app developer, you wouldn't really need to care about multi-threading that much. It really abstracts you, the streamer, uh, from multi-threading. But sometimes you might have to. Um, and also um, plugins, uh, usually they don't have to, but in plugins, there's a lot of times when you have to do advanced stuff and then you need to care about multi-threading and then things get really uh, difficult. Um, it's using obje it's, it's object oriented programming. It's uh, using um, uh, something called GObject. It's a glib API to, to be able to do G ob object oriented programming in C. Um, it's not easy to, to handle if you are writing plugins and stuff, but it's always very easy to use. It makes the APIs very nice and very easy to use. Um, and why is Rust relevant in, in this GStreamer and multimedia? Um, first of all, parsing of media formats, that's what most of the plugins actually do. Um, it's not just safe by design, like so many things can go wrong. There is random data coming from, from the internet. You can't trust it. And there, there has been like uh, zero day uh, security uh, advisories uh, in the last some years uh, with GStreamer, uh, especially with the FLV uh, decoder. Uh, there was a vulnerability where you can you know, uh, get access to the, the host um, through that. You provide a, a file that uh, somehow corrupts the memory. I don't re remember the exact details, but it was doing something with the memory. Um, so um, it, it was able to exploit that. Um, but it, if it was written in Rust, in, in safe code, um, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, and the other reason is multi-threading. As I said, it's, it's multi-threaded, and it uh, uh, plugins uh, a lot of times have to uh, deal with uh, multi-threading. And it's, in C, it's extremely difficult to handle uh, threading. Um, uh, in other programming languages, it's, it's a bit easier. But in C, it's, it's even more difficult to, to do multi-threading right. Um, you will do it wrong, and that would have severe consequences. Um, and as I said, in Rust, you usually don't have to bo uh, like be concerned at all when you do multi-threading. If you do it wrong, compiler will tell you, and you will solve. The, you will satisfy the compiler, and then you won't have any crashes or anything like that, and simultaneous access to uh, data and m mutating at the same time and things like that. Um, and um, mutability um, and ownership concepts of, of, of Rust, they um, map really well um, with the GStreamer. Um, and uh, for example, there is a, 
um, in GStreamer, there's a concept of GST mini objects. So uh, as I said uh, uh, about G object, um, GST mini object is a variant of that uh, that is much uh, a lot lightweight than than a proper G object. It um, um, has less API and stuff, but it's it's very lightweight. So if you want something uh, in GStreamer, there is a lot of things uh, that are uh, created and destroyed very fast. And like uh, in one second, there will be like thousands of these mini objects created and destroyed. And you want it really really fast. All this stuff. So um, that's why they invented something called GST mini object. But the problem is um, they didn't want to have uh, muta um, mutatable re access to um, to the same mini object by different threads or multiple parts in the code. Um, so they have a restriction there, which is that if it, it's read only, unless um, it's read only uh, if uh, the reference count is uh, more than one. If multiple, uh, there, there's multiple references to the same object, mini object, um, you can't modify it. Um, and it, it, there is no really guarantee, the real guarantee there, um, but um, it tries. You know, in C you can't do much, um, but in Rust you can do it much better. I'll, I'll show an example if time permits at the end, how exactly that works. Um, and also, you avoid a lot of a huge class of memory problems if you if you write in Rust. That's a generic um, uh, advantage, anyway. Like it's not just specific to GStreamer, but um, anything. Um, also, C is an archaic language. Um, it's um, it's not just unsafe; it's really old. It doesn't do a lot. Like nowadays, you 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 want more. You do, you can't be handling pointers and everything manually and doing everything manually. Um, you need a higher level language. Um, so um, Sebastian Drog, as I mentioned, he, he wrote these bindings, uh, first of all, for, for Rust, um, uh, GStreamer Rust, RS. Um, and um, with these, you can uh, use already um, in, in your application. There's at least one or two applications out there. Uh, they're not very mainstream, but they exist, and people are working on them. Um, and they, they are in, uh, in Rust, and they use GStreamer in there. So um, uh, you can do that, uh, but also you can write plugins, um, and uh, this um, uh, GST plugins RS, the second repository here, that's um, that's for that. There's all these plugins written in, in Rust there. Um, hopefully, this this repository will get bigger and bigger, and you will have more and more plugins written in Rust rather than C, and you can rely on them. Um, or most of the security problems that I mentioned that arise in GStreamer, they are in, in G, uh, G, uh, the plugins, not the GStreamer core, because it's so the core is so tiny. It's, it's unlikely that it, it uh, will have problems. Also, it's extremely well tested so uh, over the years, so it's uh, it's pretty safe in that way. Um, but plugins, they are not very safe, so it's better to write them in Rust. Um, now, I'll have a simple example here um, where um, you can see the advantage of why do it in Rust. This, this very simple code, this will compile just fine in, in C. Uh, nothing from compiler, no help whatsoever, um, that there is a lot of problems with this code. Um, it looks very innocent. Uh, the caps, as I mentioned, uh, caps is just GStreamer capabilities. Um, uh, it's a representation of one uh, of the capabilities of a pad, and um, each capability is in the form of uh, something called GST structure. Uh, so that's what's happening here. Uh, what we are saying is that um, give me the the first uh, capability in the form of the structure um, from from these caps that we we have, and um, then we are asking it to remove that um, that structure. And then we are using, we are setting, we are mutating that um, that structure after we have told it to to um, remove it. Um, in in um, so the API of get structure, this gives you um, not your own reference in C, on C level. So this this thing will crash or cause memory problems in C, but the compiler is not telling you that. Uh, so let's see what uh, the Rust compiler says. Can you read this at all? <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> so um, the the error you are getting here is uh, uh, about the set, um, uh, but you can see the code, right? So the last uh, statement here, uh, uh, Rust compiler is saying to you that the uh, S in here does not have the set uh, method, but I can assure you uh, a structure. 
um, GST structure has a set method and it should have it, but why is the compiler saying it doesn't exist? The reason is that um, you are not, on the Rust level, you are not getting a uh, structure actually, you are getting a thing called option. It's a wrapper type in Rust. Um, in C, uh, you have the equivalence with, um, with null pointers. So when you do the same thing in C, you will just get a null pointer, which you will know only at compile uh, runtime, and you, if you use the uh, null pointer, uh, things will you know, crash, uh, unless you are doing a null check. Um, but um, Rust doesn't have that concept. It can't, you can't have a null um, pointer. You, so you, what you get is an option, and the option is an enum, which is either a none or some. And if you have some, then that means there's something in there, and then you can get a pointer to that. Um, so I'll give you the example code there. So this one, in that regard, will, uh, will work. So now you're not getting the structure, but you are unwrapping the, uh, you're using this um, pattern matching in, in Rust to, um, uh, so if, if you, from this function called get structure, if you get something, it gets assigned to the S, and then you can use it and be sure that it won't be null. Um, it's, it's a guarantee. You can also have an else there if you want to handle the case when it's null, um, but I didn't do that here. Um, so we solved one problem now, but the compiler will give you even more errors now um, because um, you, you really can't see it, right? Um, so um, when we remove the structure here, in here, um, you're, you're getting a mutable, uh, bo you're borrowing uh, caps as mutable because you're mutating it because uh, you're removing something from it. Um, and um, that's, that's not right because then you, you can't modify the, the structure and you're using the s.set and you're modifying it. So that's, that's not allowed. Um, and it, that's why you get uh, some errors about it being non-mutable. Um, so we solve the mutability problem by uh, using another function. Instead of get structure, you use get mut structure and that gives you a mutable reference. And um, then you can hopefully call these functions, right? And also the caps, you, you want to get the mutable reference to it. Um, so um, you, want, you want to call get mute on it and then uh, call get, get mute structure on that one instead. And all this would not be pointed out by a C compiler. There's so many problems with this code. Um, and now you get into another error, which is about multiple mutabilities. Um, so when you did this caps.getMut, you, you, get you got a mutable reference to, to the caps. Um, and, then, um, and then you do c.remove structure, and that again uh, tries to get a mutable reference. And so you have a mutable, multiple mutable reference in the same place for the same um, actual resource. And that's, that's just uh, calling for uh, problems, right? Um, and and it's, the compiler is right to not allow you to do that because, as I said, you remove the structure, now the structure doesn't exist, and now you're writing to it, so that just won't work. Um, so what, finally, we, we will have a code that actually would work, and that's um, you get a mutable structure, you get a then, uh, sorry, mutable caps, and then mutable structure, and then um, you uh, set what you need to set, and then you can remove the structure if you want. Although it doesn't make any sense, you just wrote to a structure that you just removed, but this will work, actually. And this is safe code. Uh, that's why it works. Um, yeah, it works fine. Um, and as I said, in C, it, won't, it will just build, but in runtime, you will have multiple problems to handle. Um, but now that you built it, it will just work as you want it to work. It, it, there's no problem at runtime anymore. Um, uh, I have said anything I said. Am I out of time? <laughs> okay. Um, but just wanted to say, uh, please don't write new project in C and C++. At least consider doing it in Rust um, because you don't want to create an unsafe world. You want a safer world, and that's what Rust achieves for you without any runtime costs. <laughs> that's all from me. I think I'm out of time, but uh, can I take one question? Okay. Anything? Okay. Uh, any questions? 
Either nobody understood anything or I, <laughs> people understood everything. Um, I would ask a question. Like, okay. um, what is it that you do with that combination, like Rust and GStreamer in practice? Um, so as I like tr uh, tried to show through the example, you um, when you when you do it with Rust, you won't have all those runtime problems. That some of them you will see immediately, right? Like the memory oh, access oh, oh. problems. No, no, no. I don't yeah. mean the advantages that yeah. I got. No, I mean like, uh, do you know of any projects? Because I would propose one. <laughs> Um, as I said, there is these uh, two media players that mm -hmm. I know that uses it, and I think also now there is another um, desktop GNOME app uh, for me it's a me metrics client. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I forgot the name, mm -hmm. and that that is written in Rust. And now they are using multimedia for uh, audio, video, or something like that. Exactly, uh, because I have seen I've come ac across one use case that is a bit more out of the ordinary, which mm -hmm. is time lens. Have you heard of the project? No. That is essentially taking any video input and compiling it into a timeline where the, uh, where the individual segments visualize a frame okay. so that you can basically anticipate the mood and the you know, uh, parts, specific sections of the film just by looking at the timeline. Okay. It's quite neat, Timelines.io. Cool. And it's in Rust? Yes, it's Rust and GStreamer. Oh, cool. No, I know. <laughs> no other questions? Good. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Mm.